we're going to uh, turn to 1 John 3.23. I want to talk about faith and love and drop water. Uh, something that I've, I've been seeing for years and years, but it's just really come forward in this bridal prayer idea. You know, God, uh, it says that he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. That's Father's intent, to, to know us as sons. But for Jesus, he gave himself to, for us that he might wash us with the water of the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And so he has done what he's done for us to be his wife. God the Father did what he did with his son for us to be sons and daughters. And then Jesus did what he did. The same act, but one's heart was for a family. The other heart was for the closest imagery we have in the earth of, of intimacy and oneness and relationship, marriage. And so there's something really huge on that. I just want <clears throat> to tell you a couple things real quick. One is, uh, I'd like us, before we get started in the Word, to take a moment to pray for our elections, as we will in the nation's prayer. I'd like you to encourage you to stay. Uh, the, the beautiful thing about democracy and the way it was designed is that the Bible says that the king's heart is like a river of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wants. So when we go into an election booth or, you know, like if I already mailed my, my ballot in, when we make those decisions, we are a king at that moment and our heart can be turned and God can shift and direct us into the way he chooses. And we can, that's why prayer then can put a canopy over a, 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 and an atmosphere over land that allows hearts to go toward peace instead of war, toward trust instead of lust and stuff like that. So it's a kind of a funny way prayer was put in position higher than voting, but, but in the concert of voting, it makes massive change. Because we're not just trying to shift the heart of one man, we can begin to shift the heart of a nation. So can we pray together for that? And then we'll get into the word. Father, thank you for the elections. Thank you for the... The way you brought forth the whole idea of a republic and the way of representative government. We know, Lord, that we might look at things and say, oh, this is so far off what it, the gold standard it was set on, but it, it still is a very powerful institution that has been able to withstand the test of many, many attacks and many, many efforts of man's lust and fears. But we pray today for this election coming on the, the Tuesday, that you will come upon and move upon our land. You will set a, 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 a canopy of your peace and order and des delight, that you will watch over the elections. There will be no acts of terrorism, no uh, uh, insidious works of darkness, no fears. No. Uh, uh, we just declare instead that the hearts of men will be turned, each one individually, men, women, as they go to make their votes. And they'll They'll, they'll, they'll think past the rhetoric and past politics and past even their own uh, background and, and, and loyalties. And they'll listen for the voice of the Lord. And you will begin to shift hearts. And hearts will turn one vote at a time, one heart at a time. We know that's what revival is, one heart at a time. We know that our nation's future is the, in the heart of men turning to you. So we pray that in, in our voting, we will be surrendering to the lordship of Jesus as you have declared the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So we pray grace over the United States of America and all her territories. Grace to every state. Grace to every precinct. Grace to every county. And, and, and grace to all the federal elections. Grace. We bless this time. May it be a time of you establishing more your rule and reign in the hearts of men. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes, Lord, let it be. <clears throat> you can also, um, I'm just going to make this a quick announcement. This Friday, Cammie's scheduled to get uh, a new hip. And yeah, oh, well, it's going to be good now. <laughs> and uh, her request is uh, no flowers. Just sign up and work in the children's ministry. 
And if you want to do something, she's not going to be doing that for a while. We've got some new things growing in the children's ministry. So you can join that. And uh, Norco, you can announce next, there's a children's ministry meeting with leaders. And if you're interested in getting involved in children's ministry because you want to do something because you love Cammie so much, come and join them after lunch. Lunch is provided. Yeah. Right. We don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't eat food. We eat weird. Now, Cammie's trained me. I know how to cook for her. Actually, I don't cook. We eat pretty much a lot of raw stuff. So it's just salads and stuff. But so we're good. So prayers, Friday morning is scheduled. Blessings. We'll take any hip from God, from through the doctors. But this has been about a 20 year miracle of sustained mobility in the midst of, you know, injuries. And then this last spring, about April, it got a really, the last re-injury at a CrossFit training. And since then, it's just not working. So I uh, appreciate your prayers and, and thank you. Okay, so let me release now a, 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 a powerful scripture, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that, uh, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandment abides in him and he in him. And this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So back to verse 23. So the Holy Spirit is the witness that we are in a covenant and the new covenant that was set in motion, Jesus Christ brought a new commandment. The new commandment was that we would love God we would love one another as he had loved us. The old commandment was that we were to love one another as we loved ourselves. The old commandment made us the standard to which love needed to flow from. We should never do for to another what we did not want done for us. We should love one another like we loved ourselves. Jesus took it and put it through the roof and said, I just want you to love everybody like I loved you. Now, at first that sounds like a total, oh no, that's just going to be even harder than the first one. But it isn't because it's, it's dependent upon that, uh, that you love one another as I have loved you. So we have to be loved. So in, in order for us to be the witness of this new covenant of love, we have to be loved. So that means we're going to have to open ourselves up to an experience of love through Jesus Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a moment. But then let's go to the other one. God said, I have one commandment for you. Father said, I want you to believe on my son. If you believe on my son, I will make you righteous. If you believe on the resurrection of my son, I will impute to you righteousness, justification. I will place peace in your life. I will make you stand in grace and I'll give you hope of glory. All because you believe on the name of the son, my son, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that's harder than the old covenant. Because now I, you know, I, I have nothing to fall back on. I can't point to anything I've done to justify myself being loved or accepted or made right. I can't make my own list of commandments that I get to keep because they're kind of flow with the way I like to live. My whole, my whole life is now dependent on these two pillars. One is to believe, faith. And the other is to love. I have to be loved in order to love, and that faith that I have, I'm going to hold out, I'm going to extend, is going to be given to me, because it comes from hearing. It's the faith of Jesus. To do all of this, we're given a wonderful gift called the Holy Spirit, the beautiful, glorious Holy Spirit, who settles Himself in us and is upon us, in us to sustain us in our relationship, and upon us to do the work of witnessing. And while we're there, he always is affirming us these two pillars. Now, I say faith and love because hope is what generates in between faith and love. It is the part of, it is the, part of the future that gives us a sense of yes, but it isn't there. We can't touch it. We can't see it. So hope is something that is very uh, organic. It's constantly fluctuating to the future, but it's not ever uh, limited to the present. So you can go past a deadline, past a due date, past a moment when you needed it to happen, past a, di- a time on the calendar when you thought it would happen, and it doesn't change the fact that God's word is true and what he said he still prom- plans to do in the children's ministry. So you can... Uh, 
Hebrews, Romans 4, it says he, he had to hope he had hope against hope. He had to then believe in the hope that was now being spoken. At this time next year, you're going to have a son. And his son is named Isaac. And his mom is named Sarah. So all of a sudden, a whole new hope broke forth from a hope that had been launched almost 25 years prior. But had gone through some major setbacks. And he had to go, okay, I'm going to believe. But that's another message. We'll do that maybe on Wednesday. So now go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I love this chapter because it is within a, a, a probably 14 verses. Paul lays out even less than that because he does about first three or well, uh, salutation. He lays out the entirety of our new covenant relationship with God as son, father to son, as a heritor, as uh, one who has been given get called to be joined in together with him it's just it's just for me often it's a prayer of, of, of praise to the Lord to just declare these but after you get to verse 14 he turns the whole entire declaration into a prayer and so he makes a declaration that we are you know before God in love holy without blame that we've been predestined as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to, you know, to the praise of his glory. It goes on and we have inheritance and we have it's all according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He just establishes us into something that we've been just set in. And, and I know in life right now, we look around life and we go, I just think things unraveling. Well, things that unravel are unravelable. 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 Unravel. Oh, ouch, sorry. We'll just skip that word. <clears throat> they're shaking because they're, the what is un, unshakable is coming. And you're in the unshakable kingdom. You and I are established in there by covenant and through inheritance and through promise. So he says in verse 15, chapter 1, verse 15, Therefore, Paul is speaking, I also, after I heard of your faith, in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So in the first church, in the early church, there was a recognition that we were given supernatural faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and supernatural love for one another. Love was not merited on performance, nor was faith merited on our performance. It was something given to us in Christ and something of, for us to be experienced in Christ, and then something to be given, to be released to one another through Christ. So chapter 2, chapter 3, we spoke on this on last Sunday. I touched on this. Chapter 3, verse 8. This, we're called to sit in heavenly places with Christ. And when we, we, we take the time to discover what Jesus has done, because this is our future. And when we hear him speak, we often think, oh, it means this, it means that. That's why hope is always so kind of like, well, we, it's going to turn this way, it's going to turn that way. It's, it's not what we're building, it's what we're waiting for and anticipating and are saved in. But it's not something to which we, have, we build the confidence from. Our confidence is in the faithfulness of God and the words he's spoken and Christ Jesus, the provision for everything and the love that we have been experienced in Christ Jesus, we can release to others. And that's what life grows up in. And when it starts to live, when we start to function that way, here's the ultimate. God is saying, I am now establishing over all of the, I'm, my, 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 the witness of whom I, well, let me just read it. Verse 8. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So this mystery, which is all for the three chapters, you can just take your time and just kind of read them slowly and pray them. You begin to see this plan of God that we are a part of and not, not an afterthought. We are right in the plan. And it's important to, you, a lot of times we feel disconnected because we're not submitting to the connection provided. I really... 
uh, I'm going to minister this soon, and I'll just say it. We're always talking about that identity theft, illegitimacy, orphan spirit, fatherlessness. The Lord started ministering to me. He says, people are fatherless because they won't submit to my discipline. Because unless you are being disciplined by the Lord in a fashion, then you are not going to be dealt with as a son. That's all Hebrews 10, 12. When we are, so and a discipline is just, usually you'll feel it's a, it's a place where God is saying, I need you to rise up here. Or I need you to agree with me here. I need you to, to uh, observe this. I need you to, re, you know, watch your tongue over here. It's, it's a place where we're being chastised so that we can share in his nature. So he's not trying to, he's not, he's not focused on the negative. He's focused on the positive. He's focused on our becoming. So he's asking us, I want you to agree on this, this place of who I am so that you can come up to who I am because I want you to be as I am. I want you to be, you are my son. I want you to act like my son. So that, anybody feel any, any disciplines in your life where the Lord's kind of saying, come on, what? You know, it's, it's important. It really is. It's the funniest thing. It's comforting. We, psychologists have proven that. You give a child freedom to do anything they want, anytime they want, whenever they want, they are super insecure. Because the scariest thing in this world is to think that there's nobody bigger than me. To think I am the one who, can't, who is in charge of my future, that's scary. But if I understand that I have authority over me, if I understand that, there are, that, that I have restraints that I have yielded to, given my place to, then I'm learning something that even Jesus had to learn. He had to learn obedience. He had to learn to listen to the voice over him by the things he was going through, the suffering that he was walking through. He had to reconcile circumstances back to God. That's why prayer isn't about changing circumstances. It's about changing you. It's about changing me. It's about recalibrating me to God in the circumstances that are trying to disconnect me from God. And if I practice the, the conversation, if, I, if I'm diligent at it, I can be returned to the Lord again and again. And what I'm learning is obedience. That, learn, that word obedience means to hearken under, to listen under, to come under someone else's words. Again, there's nothing scarier than to think you're in charge of your future. There's nothing scarier than to think that the words you speak are who you are and have to prove that to others. There's nothing scarier than to think that, that life is coming from me and I've got to take care of me. When I, when I begin to ex accept what you say over me is greater than what others say of me. Even more important than what I say of me is what you say over me. And if I begin to say what you say over me, then I am agreeing with you. Now I am in submission, but I also, I'm also in safety. It isn't for me to defend myself. When Jesus heard the words, you are my son, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, the first thing the Holy Spirit did was take him to meet the devil. And the first thing the devil said to Jesus after the 40 days of fasting, he said, if you are the son of God. So he wanted to dislodge Jesus from a spoken word of identity that the father gave him. And he did it not by saying, if you are the son of God, you're not the son of God. There's no way you're the son of God. He simply asked him to prove it. If you are the son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. And Jesus did not go back into his experience to defend himself. So many of us are making huge mistakes because we have encounters with God and we think the encounter has authority to face the devil. No, the word of God is where the authority is to face the devil. So he simply says to the devil, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Once he spoke the word, the devil had to stop that, that, uh, uh, that frontal attack and came back again and then came back again. But each time Jesus would say, it is written. So the written word, that, which is found in the scriptures, gives us the authority to say no to the circumstances, but it comes through a, an experience inside the written word so that it's, it's, it's both personal and it's, I know the Lord said this to me and this is what the Lord said and this is what it's written. And we're learning that in the things we're going through. 
We're not learning that. We're hearing it in the presence, but then we're tested. Everything we hear will be tested. It has to be tested to have its worth. It's just an opportunity. It's a possibility. It's an invitation. That's what calling means. Calling is invitation. Hey, come on, follow me. I got a plan for you. And we go, great. But then when we back away, the plan just kind of goes on hold. It doesn't go away, never changes. It's just as soon as I start engaging again, there's the plan again. But the reason I disengage is I get freaked out. I go through stuff that I go, I do not want to face that. There's got to be another way. And I go, you know, I pull over, you know, re-put in the address on my phone, see if I can reroute myself around the traffic. And it's not like my phone. God has just one way. Just say, just just go forward. Just follow me. Just go forward. It's okay. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. I'm thinking, well, that's easy for you to say. So here we are. God's saying, I want to just let everyone know, verse 8, 10, I want the whole wisdom of God to be made known to all of the principalities and powers. I'm going, oh, great. Like, they're going to really be happy that you are telling the earth that the church is now carrying the fullness of God. So he then immediately says, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which... uh, no, 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 we're back. get back in Ephesians. You were, you were in the right spot before. Ephesians uh, chapter 3, to the intent that now the, verse 10 says, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're all going to win because Jesus Christ won. We're all going to end up where we're supposed to because Jesus Christ is Lord. But we're all going to pay a big price to get there ourself. We're going to learn to trust. We're going to learn. If we don't trust, we're just going to rust. It's just basically you have two choices in life. You just keep trusting or start rusting. You go into the decay of the earth and to the the impossibility of the future because the world gets less opportunist, less of an opportunity. And yet God is going, I'm increasing opportunity. I'm opening a greater door. I'm doing a great thing. And our soul goes, I'm not believing any more of that. It doesn't take me anywhere but disappointment. God says, no, disappointment's my door to your new appointment. It's just, he's shifting, he's shifting, he's releasing, he's letting go. So he immediately says, and, and we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. See, if, if what my faith gives me is that communion table. What that faith, my, my faith gives me is a chance to say, Jesus, I want to come and have a conversation in the holiest of holies, in the presence of my Father, sitting on the throne of grace with you, my high priest. I want to come and bring the promises you've given me and the problems I'm, that are besetting me. And I want to just start in, uh, being, having a current recalibration of my entire who I am emotionally, physically, financially into truth. And I want truth to take hold of who I am. And I want to enjoy the, I want to experience the victory you're already in. So I'm coming in boldly with access and confidence, with faith in him. And then he says immediately, therefore, I don't lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. So Paul's saying, listen, I've gone through a lot, but don't let that bum you out or freak you out. It's going to release greater glory. Everything's going to release greater glory. Everything is made to design by heaven to bring greater glory. Everything hell sends against you is to destroy you. But God's plan is that everything that comes against you will release greater glory. Because Jesus Christ only knows one thing, and that's glory. Now listen, we'll, and we'll close, because now this, is good, this, scripture, this prayer is going to make. This is his second prayer. For this reason. I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you be rooted and grounded in love. There we go. There's faith and love. But here we have the power and the help, just like we saw in 1 John 3, that the Spirit of God was there. Now the Spirit of God is here again. Father, my body needs to hold its place in agreement with me, the head. 
And I need them to have, practice the access and withstand the tribulation. So I'm asking you now, Father, send from your glory the riches, your strength and might. Holy Spirit, grab it. Now bring it down into each individual member of the body and put it in their inner man. Just put it in there. Why do you need power in your inner man? So that Christ can dwell in my heart by faith and I can be rooted and grounded in love. See, faith and love need the power of God to, to live beyond a mental ascent. And if all we do is agree with faith and love, we're going to live in condemnation because we'll never live it. But if we have a power experience, it takes what is truth and makes it experiential. And we can go, whoa, I really feel the strength of the Lord in me. I don't know that it's going to last more than five minutes, but thank God I got it for five minutes. You see, that's how prayer starts. You don't start with holding it for five days. You hold it for five minutes. You enjoy God's presence for an afternoon. You feel his strength as you go through a very difficult time. You walk through, you go, I don't want to be here, but I know I can be here because you're strengthening me with might in my inner man. And I know no matter what I'm in, I'm, Christ is in me. And he's right here in my heart. And not only is he right here in my heart, I'm right in his love. I'm, I'm rooted you see, you have, by faith, we receive his love. And by his love, our faith works. But faith is this initiator. You go, I want to be loved by God. Well, it's going to mean two things. You have to believe what he says and be disciplined with his words. Which sometimes is like, I didn't think that's love. I want more stuff for me. But that would make you feel more insecure. It would make you feel like you're just bought and used. It doesn't matter. Now, God says to my, his children, he says, come here. I gotta, I'm going to bring you into my nature through speaking my words into your life. My words into your life will shift everything about life. And then everything will come against the words I've spoken into you. But I will give you strength and might. And I will cause you to hold this relationship with faith. And I will root you in love. And then I'll cause you to start to have experience with the body of Christ, the full love measure. And after you get to the fullness of the love, you're going to start having a mind that can think beyond where you've been and have prayers bigger than yourself. You can start praying bigger prayers. Bigger prayers. Because he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. I know when I'm not having power from heaven, living, strengthening my inner man. And that my faith in Christ and my love in Christ are not vibrant. Because my prayers get smaller and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, till after a while you don't even know why pray. But when the Lord is filling me with might, strengthening me, placing Christ in my heart, causing these to be experiences, then next thing you know, I'm ex going in the width, the length, the depth, the height of the love of God, and I'm getting filled with the fullness of God, and now God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Yeah. And going to a meeting isn't like, oh, Dear God, I want to tell you the truth is when the power of God comes, all we'll do is have meetings. The only reason we have less meetings is less power. So you never, it's, it's not, it's, it's, he collects us because he's gathering us together because he's about to do something wonderful and he's always doing something wonderful. <laughs> so let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this, this meeting, this moment. I thank you that, that we have been placed in a divine design, an inheritance being brought forth, your inheritance in the saints. I thank you that you have decided that the earth will submit to Jesus Christ inside the body of Christ, not by legislation, not by rules, not by, but by the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts and the name of Jesus being exalted in the earth and the Christ being seen. I thank you, Lord, that we have the Holy Spirit. And I ask you right now, would you receive with me right now? Holy Spirit, come, please. And would you strengthen me with might? Just ask him, strengthen me with might. I need to be strengthened, me, my life, my circumstances. Strengthen me with might in my inner man, not my outer man. Inner man gets stronger and stronger through life. Shama bahaba, give me strength in my inner man that Christ can dwell in my heart by faith. 
Lord, you're in my heart here. You're not going anywhere. You're not leaving me, and I am now aware of you because strength is causing faith to come alive and experience. And I thank you that strength is also causing love to come alive. I am loved. Say that with me. I am loved. I'm loved by God. God loves me. I am not forsaken. He's disciplining me. I am his son. I'm growing up in him. Yes, Lord. And Lord, I want to, with the whole body of Jesus, experience the width, the length, the depth, the height of the love of God so that I can be filled with the fullness of God so that I can have prayers that are bigger than me and you can have glory in your church through Jesus Christ. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. Let it be. Break it forth. Break forth. Even now, as we go into our day and we go into our prayer for the nations, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.